People are intimidated sometimes by the thought of prayer and having to pray out loud in front of people. And what I want you to know... Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. As I said, some people are intimidated by the thought of having to pray in public and pray out loud. So I just wanted to share a little bit with you this morning about prayer as I was asked to do. And I think if you take it from the aspect that it's just talking. You know, you talk to your friends and God certainly is your friend. And so you just talk to him and you can just tell him whatever you feel, whatever your question is, whatever you're thinking about. Communicating to the Lord is to tell God anything. He he keeps his secrets. He doesn't go about sharing them with everybody after you talk to him. That he at any time is there waiting, day or night, at home, in the car, at church, in the store. Uh, anywhere you go, you can talk to the Lord. And I just think that's awesome. You know, that he's there listening, waiting to hear from us. And you don't even have to always tell him physically your concerns in any special words because he understands your thoughts. He understands your needs. He understands your joy and your concern and your fears. It's okay to say you're fearful of something. It's okay to say I need help. You don't have to worry about his looking at you and saying, oh my, you know, you should have got that by now. He understands all of it. And he's leaning in your direction to hear what you have to say. He loves you that much that he's leaning toward you. And those of you who are parents are an example for your children and their freedom to pray. As a child, I was privileged to hear my family members praying throughout the day at meals, before we went to bed at night, whoever and whenever anybody came over. You know, we always had prayer. Uh, when anyone was sick, when there was death, any needs that we have, we were told immediately to take them to the Lord in prayer. And when we heard of others in need, when company came to visit, when they left, we prayed for their safety as they traveled. And we had relatives that lived in New Jersey and New York and Florida. And so when they came, because it had been 12 in my mother's family, <laughs> brothers and sisters, and had been uh, 10 in my father's family of brothers and sisters. So there were a lot of folks when they came. <laughs> and they all were interested in being prayed for. And they didn't want to leave until they were prayed for. And whenever we just had company, you know, my mother thought they, everybody should be praying. And we'd pray for them just like we, before they went to bed and spent the night with us, we all prayed together. So we need to think of our prayer as just chatting, talking with God. He's waiting there. I heard my mother and my Aunt Evelyn pray for me every day of my life. And I can hear my mother now saying, Lord, keep your hand on Louise. Protect her. You need to say that over your children, over your friends. Lord, protect my child. Protect this loved one. My Aunt Evelyn, who lived with us, was praying for us all the time. And she would say, my girl will. And she would say what you would do spiritually. One day my girl would be, she'd always say, be at headquarters. <laughs> That was of the church she was talking about. And we lived right straight across the road from the church. So we would just walk across the road and go into church and kneel and pray, you know, by ourselves. Uh, if we had something we that we wanted to talk to the Lord about in private, we just went over to the church because it was always open. And just prayed there for a while. And the my mother always said, Lord, keep your hand on Louise. Pray that over your children, over your family, over the members that are part of your life that you want to see. That they still live for the Lord and walk with him every day. And we prayed for every need. I know I prayed before every test. <laughs> I prayed for revival. We prayed for jobs. 
for studies. And as a principal, I often prayed with the children. Now, people say you can't do that, but that's not true. You know, I was a principal for 15, I think, years of high school. And if children came in, at times I would have to say, go to the bookkeeper, because her office is right across the hall, right next to mine. And I'd say, Miss so-and-so, would you mind going down the hall for a while? The in-school suspension was on the other side of me. <laughs> and the person that was in charge of that, and I'd tell them, if you don't mind, he'd just step out for a while. And I would pray for the child, or pray for the person, even parents that came in. So... Um, you can still do that. You know, we need to pray protection over all of our children and all of our friends, everybody that we meet. Prayer is an open admission that without God, we can do nothing. It's up to God. He's the one that is there to see that we have all that we need. And he has promised that to you. So you need not worry. You know, God has said, I've got my hand on you. You're my child. And you can go to him at any time. Prayer is an expression of faith in God's power. That means you trust him. You are fueled by a desire to have more of him. And we always need that. Just as you cannot have a good marriage if the two of you never speak to each other. Don't talk with each other. You've got to communicate with each other for your marriage to work, for your family to work, for anything that your friends, anything that you have communication with. So prayer is the cornerstone. That's the foundation. That's what we have to lean on. And God doesn't say that you have to come in any special way of praying. You know, I just remember one of the most important prayers that I've had throughout all of my life and that was when I was a teenager, and I still remember it. We were praying with, we were kids in school, because I went to um, Easton Pilgrim, which was a, one of our church schools in Pennsylvania. And I remember one of the boys praying, and he said, all he said was, God, save my roommate. That was one of the greatest prayers I've ever heard. God, save my roommate. So you don't have to have a, uh, embellished prayer or something that's all fixed up neat and in a package you think God hears everything that you say or that you whisper he even knows what you think <laughs> so think on these things as the word says that is a foundation for us to build a Christian life prayer is acknowledging God's presence in our lives and our growth in him. You can and need to talk to him. I talk to him going down the road sometimes. I talk to him about those people that pull over in front of me a little too close. <laughs> you know, I talk about all of the things that I need for him all through the day. So anytime, anywhere, he is leaning in your direction because he's so anxious to hear from you. To just hear your whisper, your call. So talk to him today. Talk to him anytime. Talk to him anywhere. Doesn't matter how your hair looks. Doesn't matter what you have on. Nothing else matters but that you just talk to him. And that's prayer. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Thanks for doing this. All right. um, uh, you've got a, a page from my Bible that's got, uh, it's really, really well worn, but it's halfway interesting. And as I've studied it, it has uh, opened some things up to me. Do you ever, do you ever stop to think what it's like for uh, scriptural say a guy was born so and so at this particular age, he'll have their sons and daughters? Well, a guy who had a lot of time on his hands put together this chart and you get to see what that actually looks like and it's like whoa this is cool uh, am I am I good to go now
Uh, okay, okay. So I had to do a, a study on Genesis, I, I guess about a year and a half ago, and I, and I went through it really, really slowly, and I learned some crazy things about God's revelation. And what I learned is that God is not in any kind of a hurry whatsoever to reveal himself to man. He just takes his sweet time. His time is different than ours. You know, even though a fall has taken place where men have defied him and creation is not the same as it was, even though that's, that's taken place and there is already in place a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, God doesn't publicize that. He simply puts the skin of an animal on his creation. Hey, you guys need to be covered. And we get maybe, if we're really smart, we maybe get that there's something about death and a covering there. But would I be able to put that together? No, no chance. God just simply drops a small hint as he's steering man towards redemption. And God really does take his time. It's just amazing. Um, I tried to put myself in the position of what's it like with early man. You know, those guys would be, they'd be on information overload if they saw us. I mean, we can walk into this thing called a house and we can flip a switch and a light comes on. That, that would just blow their minds uh, and things like cars and stuff like that. But as I thought about it, I think they would be blown, or we would be blown away if we saw early man. A totally, totally different way of life back then. Could you imagine what it would be like to stand in front of somebody who is capable of naming all of the birds and the animals? This is a level of intelligence that's just, you know, this, this blows our mind. And he can, he can not only name them, he can also remember them and pass them on to other generations. This is a phenomenal level of intelligence that this guy has. It does appear that as man is closer and closer to that garden, man is more and more perfect, though he has been subjected to a fall. And then you've also noticed, as you've gone through Genesis, that the further you get away from this garden, your life expectancy does go down. So, What's it going to be like living back then? First off, you're going to have to live around water. That's a no-brainer. You're going to want to be uh, experimenting with gardening. You're going to want to uh, be, be foraging in areas that are, that are, that are watered. So water is a no-brainer. But with this kind of a situation, you've got your father living over here and your grandfather living over there, and then over here you've got great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. What is that like? That's, that's, that's the result of people living hundreds of years and producing who knows how many kids. See, the, the genealogy is just traced to one man. He was so-and-so years old when he had this guy, and he had other sons and daughters. I mean, population is just doing this, but Think about that. Your great, 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 great grandfather just lives over the hill. That's, that's insane for us to think about. So our, our minds would be blown away if we saw them. Now God's revelation is, he is slow about revealing himself. Early on, you see the thing with the skin. Would I be able to put it together from that, that Jesus Christ, a member of a unit called a triunity, will suffer the death penalty to satisfy the wrath of God for my sin? No, I'd be nowhere close. But God just puts a little seed. He puts a seed in this thing about the Trinity. He starts off saying, Let's, uh, let us make man in our image. What, what would I assume from that? I know what I'd assume. There's many gods. Same thing with the Tower of Babel. Let's go down and see the city and the tower with the, with the sons of men have built. There's many gods. And a little later on, you're going to be studying Sodom when God comes down in the form of three. That dialogue with Abraham and Lot and the three is very interesting. Because as the three remain together, they have the attributes of God. As they separate, they have the attributes of God. So God drops the number three into the equation. 
would I be able to conclude that God is a trinity? Mm -mm. I would say, well, it's just three of many gods. And God is not in a hurry. He's not even revealed to man that he's omniscient. He says, well, I'll just, uh, I'll just go down and check out Sodom and see if, I've, if, they're, if they've done entirely according to its outcry. Isn't he God? Doesn't he already know? See, he hasn't revealed that he's omniscient and can do anything. He, he, he is fine to just let man have an extremely finite knowledge of him. And it just kind of goes gradual. There, excuse me. This is one of Miss Sanders' hairs in here, and it's driving me crazy. Yeah, yeah there it is. Um, so uh, God is content. He, he goes really, really slow. Now, there's a guy named Lamech, and he holds up his son, and he says, this one is going to give us rest from the toil of our hands, rising from the ground which the Lord God has cursed. And I can remember reading about Lamech in my early days, and I'm wondering, wait a minute, that's verbiage like God used back in the garden when Adam first fell. Remember that? The work, the toil of the hand, the sweat of the brow, uh, the curse on the ground. How did, how did Lamech know that? How could he repeat verbiage like that so accurately? And then I saw this chart. This chart tells me that Adam is alive until the time of Lamech. Adam almost makes it until the time of Noah. Can you believe that? That And see, so again, this, this goes back to God's progressive revelation. What you have in place with Adam is a living witness, a guy of phenomenal intelligence. And Adam is going to be able to tell people what it's like to walk with the Creator face to face, and why things are now different. And guess what the sin is Adam's going to have to explain a gazillion times. You already know that. Adam, why? Why did you do this? But for, from Adam all the way almost, it, it, well, into the life of Namek and ba Lamech and maybe 120 short, years short uh, of his son Noah, there's a living witness who's capable of revealing just a few things about God. What it's like to walk with him face to face. What we had and what we lost. That is going to be Adam's witness. And that's, it's funny. Again, God just goes slow. This is all that man gets of God. What we had, what we lo how we lost it. And he also gets the knowledge that sin changes things. Sin changes your relationship to God. That's all that's available. Now, the next level of revelation comes from Noah, another guy of phenomenal intelligence. You don't believe that. Think about what it's like to build an ark over the course of a hundred years when you have no frame of reference for what a ship is. I mean, you're talking about a genius that can put this together from just dimensions. This is a phenomenal mind. And another phenomenal mind is going to be able to bear witness. Noah is going to be alive almost until the time of Abraham. And there is another incredibly brilliant, phenomenal witness who's going to be able to increase the revelation. The revelation is now, if we rebel in mass against God, and every thought of our heart is only evil continually, God can wipe us out. So from Adam, we learn that sin changes things. From Noah, we learn that incredibly great, uh, massive amounts of sin can 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 bring the wrath of God. So God reveals a little teeny bit more. Isn't it crazy how God goes so slow? I mean, he has so much information to, to reveal to man, but he's content to just go along at his own slow and, and careful place. Now, Noah is going to be alive to see the construction of the tower in Genesis chapter 11. Noah is going to be there to say, if not there, at least 
he's going to hear about it and he can say, guys, this is not good. Babylon, I've been studying this out, doing some work in the New Testament, and tracing out God's progressive revelation of Babylon is just phenomenal. But in this land of Shinar, God told people after the flood, okay, be fruitful, multiply, spread out. Man says, no, thank you. I'm going to build a city and a tower whose top is going to reach into heaven. So they defied the desire of God, and while they were at it, they said, I'm going to approach heaven by the strength and the skill of my right hand. That is not good. So you know Noah is going to hear about this and say, guys, you know, this could be a serious problem. And this, this area, it's, it's, it's like where the, the Tigris and the Euphrates run parallel to each other. They join into one and dump down into the Persian Gulf. It's modern-day Iraq. This is the land of Shinar, ancient Babylonia, Ur of the Chaldees, uh, just north, Nineveh. All this, this whole area was built by a guy named Nimrod. Nimrod. And as you go through the scripture, this turns into the absolute seat of the anti-God agenda. It's, it's a province, you know, in the time of Isaiah, a little later on in Isaiah, it's revealed as the sensual one, the one who loves sorceries, who's very, very rich, and who actually says two times, I am, and there is no one besides me. On into the, the book of Revelation, it's revealed in Revelation 17 as the, as the religious center of the world that is absolutely aligned with the Antichrist for a time. As far as I can tell, this is the bride of the Antichrist. By Revelation 18, it's the commercial system of the, of the entire world that is phenomenally powerful. Well, a crazy thing happens from this most wicked of all places, probably on earth, God speaks to a guy who is an idolater. And he comes from a family of idolaters in Joshua 24. And God says this guy, his name's Abram, get up, start walking, I'll tell you where you're going later. And a crazy thing happens is that this idolater develops a relationship with God. Abraham is extracted from this most wicked of all places on the earth. And from this point, God takes to himself a man. The man will become a family. And this family will become his revelatory instrument to the world. God's stepping it up right now. With Adam, very limited information. With Noah, a little bit more. Now with Israel, God's taking an entire nation to be his revelatory instrument to the world. And one of the, the scariest things in the Old Testament is Israel loved to flirt with the religious practices and the idolatry of Babylon. They couldn't resist it. He revealed himself to Israel, gave them this land of promise, but they're always looking back. And God had left warning. This is from Deuteronomy 28. I will bring on you and on your king whom you set over you, a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you'll serve other gods, wood and stone. And the amazing thing about the book of Daniel that you just studied is that God is now extracting people from Israel and bringing them back to their point of origin. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy when we want to sin so much that we insist on having it and God says, okay, I insist on your having this sin. And in Daniel chapter 3, well, all the peoples, nations, men of every language, and the 10,000 Israelites who have just been deported, they fulfill Deut Deuteronomy 28 because they are forced to be taken to a strange land and bow down. It's insane how God, if you insist on doing something, God will chain you to what you insist on. Have you seen people that just cannot give up a certain sin? 
It's because they've defied the desire of God. Sin has told them, you can do this, it's okay. And eventually, they're allowed to walk through the consequences of their action. Uh, how much time do I got, hon? Uh, 10 minutes, 11.30. Okay, that'll work. So God is, has taken a nation, and he is now going to use an entire nation to be his revelatory instrument. It's going to step up quite a bit. And, you know, God says some awesome things to this nation. He says, the Gentiles are going to be fearing and trembling over you because of all the good and the peace that I'm going to be bringing you. People are going to say, what nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord their God to them whenever they call on him? The Gentiles are going to be marveling at Israel. But what if Israel decides that they want to flirt with the sins from their point of origin? What's going to happen then? Well, God has a plan B. God said, look, I am going to make you a curse and an object of horror, a hissing, a hissing and an astonishment. Men will pass by and they will see what's happened. And they will say, why did this happen? And there's going to be somebody there who's going to say, it's because they forsook the Lord their God. And they went out and worshipped other gods. A Gentile will be there to speak and say, this happened because these representatives of the Almighty forsook him. So here's the point that, that's important about to, to think about Israel becoming a revelatory instrument. God makes a sovereign choice to pick these guys. You're chosen. Nothing you can do about it. You are going to reveal my truth and my presence to the world. But it's Israel's choice which aspect of God gets revealed. If they walk with God, there's going to be phenomenal blessings that will pour out on them. If they defy God, there's going to be phenomenal wrath. But either way, the Gentiles stand in awe of what God is doing through that nation. See, God is stepping it up. And then, in the New Testament, as far as I can tell, there, there are four different revelations. I just counted this up when I was sitting in the hall. Four different levels of revelation. One goes from Adam to Noah. One goes from Noah uh, up to the time of Abraham. Abraham, God separates for himself a family creates a nation. This nation is his representative. And the fourth stage is one we're in right now. See, God had made a promise to Abraham that in your seed, singular, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God has a backup plan. And God does the exact same thing in the New Testament that he did in the Old Testament. He takes to himself, or he selects a man. And from this man, he creates a family and a nation. That's us. We're a kingdom of we're, we're a nation of priests, and we represent now God to the world. So four different levels of revelation that uh, that God has. I don't believe it. I finished up early. Wow. Okay. I, I never do that. How did I do that? Okay. Anyway, it's uh, come come on up, hon. Been, been fun to study the scripture with you guys.